Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So for today's video, I'm going to be discussing the disappearance of a very bright young man under very unusual circumstances. Some people believe that there was foul play involved, while some people believe that he might still be out there and others believe that this was an accidental death. So I'm really looking forward to hearing everybody's thoughts on this one. I'm also really hoping that by continuing to speak on this case and continuing to spread awareness about the whole situation, that maybe I can help the family get some answers and bring justice to their missing loved one. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Harry's. As a lot of you probably know by now, I am a huge fan of Harry's. I've been using them for years now, and that's because they're the only razor that I can use without ending up with some gnarly razor burn. Harry's high-quality premium blades were manufactured in their own factory in Germany, and they're complete with a precision trimmer and a flex hinge to give you a close, comfortable, and smooth shave. Not only are their blades amazing, but they use a weighted handle, and now they have a new two-tone design that has deeper grooves for improved grip, which makes shaving just that much easier. I have the chrome color and I think it just looks so nice and it's so easy to use. I also love Harry's Foaming Shave Gel. It's perfect for those of us who have very sensitive skin like I do. Their Foaming Shave Gel is made with loving ingredients like aloe and hyaluronic acid. I swear by Harry's razors. They're the only razors that work with my very, very sensitive skin. Also, Harry's is super convenient, arriving in the mail at your front door so you don't have to spend the time going to the store and shopping around for your razors. Harry's offers a starter kit which gives you everything that you need for a close comfortable shave. You will get your five blade razor, a weighted handle, a blade cover, and their foaming shave gel. The exciting news is that viewers of this channel can get their starter kit for only five dollars when you use my link in the description box below. That's harrys.com slash rachel shannon and you can get your starter kit with everything that you need for only five dollars. Thank you again so much to Harry for partnering with me on today's video and for your continued support of this channel. It's sponsors like Harry's that allow me to keep doing what I love and continue spreading awareness about these very important cases. But with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the mysterious disappearance of Jesse Galinov. Jesse Galinov is from Montreal, Quebec in Canada, and he is the son of Todd Galinov and Elisa Clayman and he has one sister named Sammy. Jesse is known to be a bright young man who, despite the many challenges he faced in his life, is always positive, happy, and has an amazing outlook on life. Jesse was one of the captains of the football team in high school, and when he was only 17 years old, he was injured in a game. He actually ended up suffering a concussion, which ended up being pretty intense, so he was left dealing with post-concussive disorder. So for a while, he wasn't able to do the things that he was supposed to be able to do in high school. He couldn't read, study, or apply to colleges like he had planned. So, while he wasn't able to use this time for himself to apply to colleges and to study, he decided to do something to help others who were also suffering. He decided to start raising money and awareness for Movember, which is an annual event where men grow mustaches during the month of November to raise awareness on men's health issues. And Jesse's focus was prostate cancer. He wrote, quote, now blessed and cursed with post-concussion syndrome. I have been able to use all of my limited energy and free time to do just that, raise money and awareness for Movember. Movember has allowed me to turn a negative thing into a positive one. I have set a goal of $5,000 for myself and I hope that I can reach it. Just because my recovery and university application process is out of my control for the moment, it doesn't mean that I still can't set other goals for myself and make a positive contribution to other people's lives. After this, Jesse was able to ultimately apply to colleges and of course he got in. Jesse went on to move to the U.S., and by 2017, he graduated from Wesleyan University in Middleton, Connecticut with a 4.0 GPA, receiving his bachelor's in mathematics, as well as a certificate in bioinformics and modeling. After graduating, Jesse decided that he wanted to go on to pursue his medical degree, so he was accepted into medical school at the Sidney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. His ultimate goal was eventually 
eventually to work with Doctors Without Borders. Jesse's mother said that he just had this huge heart. He was empathetic and he was backed by an amazing group of friends. He loved learning about other cultures and seeing new places. Throughout college, Jesse continued to work with the Movember Foundation. One of the development managers for the foundation wrote Jesse a recommendation letter which stated, quote, I can barely begin to describe the impact that Jesse has had as a campus rep for the Movember Foundation. Movember participation at Jesse's university grew 149% this campaign and can be entirely credited to the hard work, leadership, and dedication that Jesse brought to the role. His passion is unmatched at the college level and his ability to think creatively and inspire others is truly second to none. I cannot recommend Jesse any stronger for whatever path he chooses. He has been nothing but a pleasure to work with and is a shining example to his peers and others that will follow him. So before committing himself to what he knew was a very, very long road ahead of him in medical school, Jesse decided to take a gap year. In this gap year, he decided to take eight months off to embark on his dream trip. He had plans to go backpacking through South America and Southeast Asia with his first stop being in Peru. He just wanted to immerse himself in different cultures and just see a different part of the world. Jesse was a very experienced traveler. He had actually spent a semester of his junior year of college in Prague and then spent an additional seven weeks backpacking through Western Europe. So he wanted to see yet another side of the world. At this time, Jesse was back in Montreal and he was living with his mother. The whole summer, the two had planned out his trip. They planned out the route that he would take, all of the stops that he would make. They even researched and planned all of the campgrounds that he would stop in and spend the night in each night. They also went shopping for everything that he would need to take with him to make sure that he was completely fully prepared for his trip. Obviously, a big part of this trip was to go out to new places and to see new things but Jesse had planned to meet up with some of his old friends along the way. Mainly, the biggest purpose of this trip was self-discovery. Going to all of these different places and experiencing so many things outside of your comfort zone is the perfect way to discover yourself. The night before his trip, 22-year-old Jesse packed and unpacked and repacked his bag until he knew it was absolutely perfect. Some of the items that he packed in his backpack included hiking shoes, a one-person tent, a mattress, a small stove, utensils, clothes, a headlamp, his medication, his Kindle, and his journal. In total, his backpack weighed 24 pounds. The official plan for Jesse was that after he left, he would first fly into South America. He would spend a few months there and then fly to Asia in December, where he wanted to end his trip in Bangkok, Thailand on May 15th. So, Jesse left for his trip on September 24th, 2017. He first landed in Lima, Peru. He spent a couple of days there before he took an overnight bus to a town called Juarez, which is around 400 kilometers away from Lima and about a seven and a half hour drive. He arrived there on the morning of September 27th. From there, security camera footage caught him walking towards a nearby hostel called the Came House Backpacking Hostel, where he checked in at 6.30 a.m. Now, the information from this hostel is a little bit iffy, and we will come back to that later, but friends did know that he did, in fact, arrive to the hostel because the entire time, he had been Snapchatting back and forth with his friends, as well as posting Instagram stories to document his travels, so his friends were able to confirm that they did get a Snapchat showing that he did arrive to the Came House Backpacking Hostel. By September 28th, four days into the trip, Jesse texted his mom that he was going to be embarking on a four-day trek and that he would be out of reach for about four to five days but he assured her that he would be reachable again by October 2nd. The trail that Jesse was going to be taking was the Santa Cruz Trail, a 50-kilometer hike through the Cordelia Blanca Mountains. This was one of the trails that Jesse had always dreamed of hiking. This was a rough trail, reaching heights of 15,000 feet above sea level, so it's definitely important to give yourself a couple of days to acclimate to the changing levels of altitude. However, when October 2nd came without any 
word from Jesse, his family did start to get worried, but his parents weren't completely panicked because they figured that it's totally possible that he was taking an extra day or two on this trail, which isn't completely uncommon for someone who is making this trek. By October 7th, when Lisa still hadn't heard from Jesse, she started reaching out to Jesse's friends to see if any of them had heard from him. This entire time that Jesse was traveling, he had been in contact with a high school friend named Julian. They had been Snapchatting and messaging pretty consistently. However, by September 29th, all communication between them had stopped. His friends knew that if Jesse had the means to communicate with them, that at some point he would have. The initial days after he stopped contacting everybody after this period that, you know, he told everybody that he would be out of contact, his friends and family just thought that they were all overreacting. They figured that Jesse was on his own adventure. He probably got caught up with something and that he was fine. They thought that if they freaked out that Jesse would get back to them in a couple of days and they would just laugh about how they freaked out for no reason. But weeks passed and there was absolutely nothing. Now, there was one sign that made Elisa think that Jesse was okay. She saw that his Apple account was showing that he had purchased something on October 7th, so she saw this as a sign of life. But after looking more into it, this was actually a mistake. The purchase was actually made on September 28th, so, once again, after this day, there was no sign of Jesse. Elisa knew that there had to be something horribly wrong for Jesse to just stop contacting anybody. They also knew that there's no way that he would veer off of his already set travel plans because he had spent so much time specifically scheduling everything that he would do. He's planned every single day that he was going to be out there and he budgeted only for what he was planning to do. So, there's no way that he would just veer off of his original plans and not not tell anybody and not get back into contact with anybody. So, by October 14th, Elisa filed a missing persons report with the U.S. State Department. Then, she got into contact with the Peruvian embassy as well as the Canadian and American embassies as well because Jesse is a dual citizen. But Elisa said that the whole situation of dealing with all of these different organizations has been a complete mess. She met with people from the American and the Canadian governments, but she found out that no one was going to be able to help with these searches. They apparently weren't allowed to offer any sort of support or help to ramp up the search efforts in Peru. So, it was up to her, her family, and friends of Jesse, as well as the Peruvian government to search for Jesse. Now, after working with the Peruvian police, Elisa was able to retrace Jesse's steps which is what we just discussed. However, when they went to go speak with the people at the Came House Hostel, they got changing stories. So, initially, witnesses said that they did see him at the hostel, and staff members confirmed that he did check in on September 28th. However, they later went back on their statements and said that Jesse was actually never there. Apparently, these changing stories were suspicious enough to the police that this prompted them to open an abduction investigation. The next strange thing about this entire situation is that at the beginning of the Santa Cruz Trail, there's a sign that says that you need to sign in when you go on the trail so that they can log who hikes there. But it was found that apparently nobody had signed in on the day that Jesse went missing. So it was said that the sign in log just wasn't there that day, so nobody was able to sign in. It was also said initially that nobody saw him on the trail that day either. This is something that I will shortly come back to. But in the initial stages, his family and those searching for him, they were under the impression that Jesse may not have made it to the trail at all. Now, even though police did suspect criminal activity in Jesse's disappearance, Elisa said that the Peruvian police have been very difficult to work with. She said that she thinks it's partially a cultural thing, but she said that the police there just aren't motivated. They need to be pushed to do anything to help her find Jesse. It was also said that the park administrators for the Santa Cruz Trail had not been cooperative with police, nor have the mule drivers been on the trail either. So, mule drivers are people who ride mules up and down the trail to transport goods. 
It was said that they were uncooperative with the police because people working in the mountains are a very tight-knit community. So if someone like Jesse was found dead on the trail, they wouldn't want to be blamed for it. So they were all working together so that no one would take the blame for anything if it came out of this investigation. So due to the lack of action on the part of the Peruvian police, as well as Jesse's family's frustration with the lack of leads in this investigation, they went ahead and hired an elite Israeli team called the Magnus International Search and Rescue to assist her with searching for Jesse. They learned that Israel was one of the few countries that was allowed to help with searching for missing people internationally. So that's why they weren't able to get anybody from the US or Canada to help out with the searches, but they were able to go out there and conduct interviews, search along the trails and other areas to see if they could find Jesse or anything that belonged to him. Elisa also went to hike the trail herself in Peru to see what it was like. She wanted to see if she would be able to make this trek. She wanted to see what Jesse saw. She wanted to feel what he felt, and if nothing else, she wanted to finish the trail in his honor. When it comes to going out and finding her son on her own, Elisa stated, quote, I am the best option for finding my son. It's grueling, it's terrible, and I break down and sob every once in a while, but I don't give myself that luxury very often because I need to stay focused. The searches from the Magnus International Search and Rescue Team included technologies like underwater robots, drones, and they did land searches as well. They also combed through photos that were taken on the trail around those days, and they identified almost 200 travelers who were on the trail the same day as Jesse, who they thought may have spoken to, met, or seen Jesse on that trail. At this point, because his presence on the trail hadn't been documented and nobody came forward saying that they saw him, they thought, again, that maybe he didn't even make it to the trail. However, during their searches, Elisa and her team actually found two men who did interact with Jesse that day. So first, they found two French tourists who had been staying in the same base camp as Jesse on September 30th. According to them, Jesse seemed a little bit disoriented and he told them that he was feeling sick. At this point, the travelers thought that Jesse was maybe suffering from altitude sickness, but nonetheless, the next morning, Jesse did continue hiking. Then on October 1st, the same hikers said that Jesse had asked a group of Czech tourists about finding some water. He complained of a headache at this point. After this, nobody had seen Jesse. Now, they also found a group of hikers from Austria who said that they started the trail about an hour after Jesse. Then there was another group of hikers who started the next day, but they were going in the opposite direction of the direction that Jesse was hiking in. And still, neither of these groups of hikers saw Jesse anywhere. So if he passed out on a trail or something like that, nobody saw him. So now let's talk about the timeline from before Jesse went hiking. As I stated, he took an overnight bus and then he spent the day gathering supplies and then he spent the night at the hostel. He then left early that next morning to get started on his hike. So it's thought that he probably didn't get a lot of sleep during this time. Then in addition to him not getting very much sleep, he also didn't give himself a lot of time to adjust to the altitude. Again, the altitude of this hike can be very intense and if you're not acclimated, then it can make you very, very sick. So Elisa wonders if there was a situation where he may have gotten really sick from the altitude and then he passed out and maybe died somewhere on the trail. But but she thinks that if this is the situation, that somebody would have seen him. So she thinks that maybe after he passed out or died, that someone came along and moved his body and for some reason hid it very well. She also thinks that maybe he fell off of a trail and fell into a body of water and then, you know, someone found him and buried him somewhere else. But beyond that, there are still so many questions surrounding the other aspects of this case. 
If he was on the trail, why wasn't it documented? I mentioned earlier that the park administrator said that no one that day had signed the sign-in log. However, it was found that this actually was not true. The log had been out and people had signed it, but it was confirmed to have been tampered with. So, why would the park administrators want to make it look like he wasn't there if he truly was? Now, I wasn't able to find any further information on how this was tampered, what capacity it was tampered with. All I was able to find was that it was confirmed that it was tampered with. So, this makes me wonder if these park administrators initially said that nobody had signed into the trail that day, then that might mean that they don't want the police to know certain people were on the trail at the same time as Jesse. They also could have wanted people to think that Jesse didn't make it to the trail to begin with. Then, if it was tampered with, again, we don't know exactly what happened or if there was names crossed off, if there was names added or anything else like that, but if it was tampered with, maybe it was tampered with to the point that they just wanted to hide that certain people were on the trail. Because again, if police find out that the log was out there because maybe a bunch of people came forward saying that they signed the log and there was a log out, so when they went looking for it and they read through it, maybe they noticed that there were some things off about it and it was obvious that it was tampered with. That's my thought about that, but again, we don't know how it was tampered with. We don't know what was changed, if anything. We don't know what was omitted, if anything. So, that being said, Elisa wonders that if he did pass out on one of these trails, if maybe one of the mule drivers had seen Jesse or his body, and then maybe this person tampered with his body by moving it or something else. And then in order for this person to stay out of trouble, the park is covering for them. But again, we don't know why someone would want to tamper with his body. We don't know what was done with him, and we don't know why this would be something that people need to cover up. If he had died of natural causes and someone just wanted to bury him and that was a mistake, I don't see how that's a big enough mistake for someone to want to cover it up in this capacity. They could have just said this was done out of respect, we didn't know who this person was, something like that. So, I don't know. It seems more criminal, if anything, if someone did tamper with his body and they're not wanting to come out with who did it or why. According to the Help Us Find Jesse Galanoff Facebook group, Elisa believes that there may be people involved in Jesse's disappearance to some capacity. She says, though, that the Peruvian police have been very unhelpful with following up on any leads that they were able to uncover about criminal activity or suspects in Jesse's disappearance. I also saw on the Facebook group that it was shared that the U.S. government had issued an advisory cautioning against traveling to Peru. It states that there are certain areas of Peru that can put you at higher risk of falling victim to organized crime. These places include touristy areas that people generally assume are safe. The Business Insider article states, quote, Crime, including petty theft, carjackings, muggings, assaults, and violent crime is a concern in Peru and can occur during daylight hours despite the presence of many witnesses. This risk of crime increases after hours and outside at the capital city of Lima where more organized criminal groups have been known to use roadblocks and rob victims. So, it's definitely thought that Jesse may have fallen victim to some sort of crime and there may have even been witnesses to it, but people are just just too afraid to come forward with what they know. Maybe that's what the park administrators are trying to cover up. Maybe they have organized crime on their trails and they just don't want anybody to find out about it because that can hurt tourism. I think the reason that they don't want us to know who all signed into the trail that day is because everybody who signed in that day are now suspects in Jesse's disappearance. I think that if something did happen to Jesse on the trail, it could be because of a crime or it could be because the park just doesn't want anybody to know about it because they don't want to hurt their tourism numbers because, again, that's how, you know, a lot of these places make money. Maybe they just don't want to be blamed for it or something like that. I don't really know. But other than that, we don't really have an idea of what truly happened to Jesse. 
Initially, the family put out a reward of 32,500 US dollars for any information leading to the discovery of Jesse. But when Jesse's father, Todd, saw that nothing came of this reward, he worked with his friends and his family to help raise the reward for information leading to finding Jesse to $500,000 in hopes that if somebody in Peru has his son or if they know what happened to him, that this money will motivate somebody to come forward. So that's pretty much where this case is left. His mother, Elisa, has left absolutely no stone unturned in searching for her missing son. And to this day, she has done absolutely everything in her power to search for Jesse. She's gone to Peru several times. She hiked that entire trail and she was able to raise over $2 million to put towards these searches and towards the investigative efforts into finding Jesse. Apparently, she took out mortgages on her home. She put up other things for liquidation to try and just get as much money as possible to put in towards finding her missing son. His father has also set up a website dedicated to help spread awareness about Jesse's disappearance as well as other missing people who have gone missing while traveling. The website called jessieprotected.com states that its mission statement is, quote, our mission is to provide awareness, prevention, and support for anyone who travels locally or abroad with checklists and devices and other services within this site. Our support will have crests and stickers to put on your garment or equipments to alert anyone who are protected, whereby your family having your passwords or simply a GPS smartphone location device activated, we will constantly improve ourselves to make others safer in my son's honor. Jesse wanted to be a doctor and extend people's lifespans, so it's my legacy to try and pursue that for him. Together, we shall make a difference. It's our pursuit to make this a worldwide effort in all areas and languages. So, Jesse's father truly believes that it's absolutely possible that Jesse was met with foul play because at this point, absolutely nothing has been found none of his personal belongings, nothing related to him. Literally nothing that Jesse brought on that trip or used on that trip has been found. If he just passed out on a trail or fell off of a trail or something like that, then I truly believe that something would have been found during one of these very, very extensive searches. Todd also states on his website that he was able to hike up the trail and he thinks it's a pretty safe trail and that he he was able to complete it while he was there. So, someone who's this experienced of a traveler, who is fit and healthy like Jesse, someone like him should be able to complete the trail if his dad is able to. So, that is why I'm making this video. Some people believe that there is foul play that directly caused Jesse's disappearance. Some people believe that he may have passed out somewhere and that the mule carriers decided to move his body or hide his body for whatever reason. Others think that he simply died on the trail and that it's just happenstance that nobody's found any evidence of him being there. No matter what the situation is, his family deserves answers. The family has set up a GoFundMe page to help fund further searches and investigative efforts to look for Jesse. That will be linked down below, so I ask if you have any money to spare, even if it's just a dollar, please donate whatever you can to his GoFundMe. I will be personally donating some of the proceeds from this video to the GoFundMe. I also will have the Jesse Protected website linked down below, as well as the Help Us Find Jesse Facebook page. I personally think that there's just too much to this case to write it off as a coincidence. I think the fact that the park administrators were trying to cover up those sign-in logs I think that's a huge part of this case. There has to be a reason why it was tampered with, whether they know that someone on the trails is responsible or knows what happened, or if the park administrators just don't want the police snooping around and finding out information about specific people who were on the trails or specific people who work the trails. I don't want to speculate too, too much on what I think happened because I don't want to say anything that can lead anything in the wrong direction and hinder this case. But I will say that I do think that there is something going on here that's more than just Jesse passing out due to the elements. Again, I know that altitude sickness is serious. It can be life-threatening if you are not acclimated to that altitude and have, you know, no water, no food, no way to deal with it. 
but I do personally think that Jesse would know better. He is young, healthy, fit, and I genuinely believe that he would have been able to survive these conditions for long enough to get himself off of the trail and to a lower elevation. I think that Jesse would have been able to tell that he was suffering from altitude sickness, and I think he would have gotten to a point where he knew that I can't keep going like this, I need to get down, I need to get myself to a lower elevation, I need to find water, I need to find food. Because again, I'm not super experienced with this level of hiking, but I do know that altitude sickness can be hard to deal with and it can be life-threatening, but it can also be helped with the right medication. It can be helped with enough water and with enough food. So, I don't know if I believe that it's altitude sickness is what killed him. It could have caused him to pass out and die another way, but at the same time, why would someone want to cover this up? I don't really know. Again, I do think there's more going on here, but I'm really looking forward to hearing what you all have to say about that. Now, I don't know Jesse personally. He could have made a bad judgment call. You know, he could have just said, I'm going to suck it up. I will deal with the altitude sickness. It's not going to stop me from finishing the trail that I already set out to do. And maybe he did fall victim to the altitude and died some other way, either by passing out or something like that. But his mother knows him best and she does think this is a possibility, but she also thinks that there's so many other things involved with this entire situation and I would have to agree. Honestly, all of this is so up in the air that all we can do at this point is spread awareness about Jesse's disappearance and hope that the right people who know the right information will come forward to the police and tell them what they know. Along with all of the other, you know, suspicious things with this trail, we also have the people at the Came House who have conflicting statements. I don't really know what to make of that either. I think that this entire case could be a situation of people just knowing that the police are involved, knowing that this person is missing, and they just don't want the police to get involved with them for one reason or another, and they just don't want to talk. I think that it could be possible that when they confirmed that he was there, that, you know, they didn't know he was a missing person at the time, and that when they came and changed their stories later, it was after they found out that he was missing, and maybe they just didn't want to be connected to a missing person, and even if there's no, you know, suspicious involvement there, that could explain why they changed their stories. But again, we don't know. There's so many things about this case that are so suspicious that really lead me to believe that there could be a lot more than just, you know, someone falling victim to the elements going on here. Jesse Galanov is described as 5 feet 10 inches tall and is approximately 170 pounds with wavy brown hair and brown eyes. Family members are asking anybody with information on Jesse's whereabouts to email helpusfindjesse at gmail.com. But that is all of the information that I have on today's case. I wish I knew more about this case, but at this point, we're just left to hope that somebody will come forward with more information that can connect the dots and help us find where Jesse is. If there was one video that I asked for you to share, it would be this one, either the video or share any of the sources that I have listed down below. I want Jesse's story to get out there as far and as wide as possible, to as many countries as possible, to as many people as possible who have traveled to Peru. Anybody who can provide us with information about Jesse's whereabouts. Maybe hearing his story and seeing his face can jog someone's memory. Maybe, you know, knowing how many people care about Jesse and care about his whereabouts, maybe that'll cause somebody to come forward with what they know. But now I want to know what all of you guys think. What do you think happened to Jesse? Where do you think he is? Do you think he's still out there somewhere? What do you think about all of these suspicious circumstances surrounding Jesse's disappearance? Please let me know that and any other thoughts or theories you have in the comments below. But with that, if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow the link down below and head to harrys.com slash Rachel Shannon to get your starter kit for only $5. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. Below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. 
stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!